did you join the Air Force? I originally joined the Air Force for a couple reasons. The first one was I was in college originally for a couple years pursuing a wildlife ecology degree and I didn't really have uh, the discipline over time and was not uh, just a really good student. I ended up working pretty much full time at a Chick-fil-A. Uh, I worked there for a while and uh, living paycheck to paycheck and pretty much barely making it through was rough and I knew that life was not supposed to be lived like that and I knew at a young age I had a passion to serve. I feel like that was one thing that I grew up uh, learning is that we're on this earth to serve. So I knew I wanted to have a calling for the military. So I ended up joining a little bit uh, later on. I ended up joining uh, when I was uh, 22. It was a pretty easy choice for me to pick the Air Force because most of my family's all Air Force. Both my grandfathers were Air Force, stepdad Air Force, dad Air Force, and two of my uh, close cousins are still active duty uh, in the Air Force. So uh, it was a pretty easy decision for me to choose that. How long have you been in the Air Force and what is your current rank? So I've been in the Air Force for uh, three and a half years and my current rank is Senior Airman E4. You're hoping that you made staff this time around. Yep. So you're waiting for results this year. Yep. Should find out in a couple of weeks, but I feel good about it. What is the name of your job and the AFSC? So the name of my job is RPA Sensor Operator, and my AFSC is 1U0X1. Did you get this job when you were in depth, or did you end up signing an open contract? So I got this job in depth, uh, in the depth program. I sat in that program for a couple months. Did you sign a four- or six-year contract? So I signed a six-year contract. I just figured that four years would go by pretty quickly, so uh, I at least knew that whatever I was going to end up doing in the Air Force, which I had an idea already, but I knew that six years would at least give me a bigger option to get my ducks in a row. Was this something that you wanted to do? I knew I wanted to do any kind of enlisted air crew job since, like my stepdad, he was a, a pilot for over 20 years in the Air Force, and then my dad was an uh, enlisted air crew for pretty much his whole career, so he was a flight engineer, which is a disappearing career field now. It's only on a couple airframes in the Air Force, but uh, I didn't want to do this job originally because I didn't really know too much about it. What other jobs were you interested in doing when you joined them? Uh, really, the only like enlisted air crew jobs that I knew about was a uh, flight engineer, but as a, you couldn't be a flight engineer uh, as a first-term airman. You had to uh, basically uh, you had to have prior air crew or aviation experience, uh, load master, because that was one of the only other jobs that I knew about. Where is your tech school located? So we actually go through uh, a couple of places for training. So once you graduate basic training and your airman's week, uh, as a 1U, as a sensor operator, you're going to go to Lackland Air Force Base, which so you'll be staying on that base. and uh, You'll go to the 344th Training Squadron and attend something called Air Crew Fundamentals. Uh, all enlisted air crew jobs go through this course. It's about a week long to begin. It's a immense amount of information in a short amount of time. So one of the things to be prepared for is the demand of studying that you're gonna have to do from the moment you get there to even when you stay in this career field now, you're constantly learning new things. So. When you show up, you're going to be learning about the different kinds of airframes in the Air Force that um, enlisted air crew jobs are on. So you'll learn about like AWACS, J-STARS, um, AC-130s. You'll learn about different uh, career, career fields and what they do. Um, and then you'll have to take this test at the end. So immense amount of information, short amount of time. The thing that gets most people in this career field is anything academic related in this career field that is below an 85 percent is a failing grade so once you um once you understand the importance and how much studying you have to be able to do then uh, you're off to a right start uh that whole point of that course is to weed the people out that are not serious about doing this job um, once you complete that course you will go to uh, Randolph Air Force Base, which is uh, just on the other side of town of San Antonio, kind of about 10 minutes from New Braunfels. Uh, it's a beautiful base. And then you'll go to um, uh, BSOC, which stands for Basic Sensor Operator Course. It's, uh, it's about 41 days. Um, 
but it can end up being a, a slightly longer. Um, so basically you'll go through seven blocks of training uh, where you'll learn about what you operate, um, which is the camera on the, uh, depending on what airframe you get, but you're gonna learn about your mission sets um, and either the MQ-9 um, or if you get assigned to the RQ-4, uh, that's a little different, but I, I can't really test to that that side too much because I'm not qualified on the aircraft. And then you'll learn about um, different um, systems and you'll learn about uh, just some of the basic definitions, mission sets, uh, navigation, and then uh, at the end of each block you'll take a test. So you'll basically have a test every week. Uh, again, 85, anything below an 85 is a failing grade so you constantly have that pressure. So you really only have uh, two shots. Uh, they might maybe we'll give you a third chance but you really only have two two opportunities uh, before uh, you can get uh, reclassified into another job which you will most likely not be reclassified into another air crew job if you uh, wash out of that course and then once you finish that course uh, you earn your uh, your wings there which your wings are the uh, enlisted air crew wings which is any one alpha job uh, in the air force then you'll get your assignment, uh, your airframe, um, and then what? obviously your assignment. So most people now, uh, we do not use uh, MQ-1s anymore, so now you'll either get the MQ-9 Reaper or the RQ-4 Global Hawk, two completely different mission sets, um, completely different planes. Most people right now is going through are usually getting MQ-9s, um, so you'll get that in your base. Depending on where you go, so as an MQ-9, you'll go to Holloman Air Force Base, and as an RQ-4 Global Hawk, guy you'll go to uh, Beale Air Force Base in uh, Northern California. Once you finish that training you'll go to your operational base. Holloman Air Force Base for your initial qualification training or IQT as they call it it's supposed to take about four months but due to um, weather that comes in like thunderstorms you know all the crazy weather that happens in New Mexico it'll usually push your training back about a month or two. Most of us end up being there about six months before we go to our operational base. Then once you finish that, you'll you'll actually go to your operational base, and then you'll have to learn. You'll go through MQT there, which is your mission qualification training. So whatever squadron you go to, you'll uh, you'll learn the specific mission set before you're actually starting to fly operational. So that's whether if you go um, for the MQ9s. Again, I'm not going to talk too much. I don't really know much about the RQ4s, so I'm not going to talk towards them, unfortunately. Yeah, the MQ9s you'll either get assigned to. Um, launch recovery element or mission control element, um, which is uh, two different mission sets. One involves you uh, deploying, and the other one involves you working uh, rigorous shift work at home station. Overall, what was tech school like for you? Tech school was fun, but it was also really stressful. You you have to sacrifice a lot to get through. If you don't have the dedication to and the discipline to study. Um, and to really learn your job and to ask the questions um, even if something seems like a stupid question if you don't have that will and that drive you will not make it through but for me yeah tech school is a lot of fun um, I made a lot of great friends and I met a, I did a lot of great networking so I know you had kind of mentioned some bases that you can go to uh, what are all the bases that you can be stationed at off the top of your head that you know of so far Cause you're kind of limited to specific bases. Yeah, so, um, and f like I said, I can't attest, f I'm not going to speak fully to RQ4s, but I can at, at the same time, because I know where, where they go as far as home station. So if you end up getting assigned to the RQ4, um, you can get stationed at a Beale Air Force Base, you can fly your operational there, or you can get assigned to uh, Grand Forks in North Dakota. For MQ-9s, you can get assigned at uh, Creech Air Force Base, which is just north of Vegas, um, Cannon Air Force Base uh, in uh, southeast New Mexico, uh, Ellsworth Air Force Base, which is in South Dakota, Whiteman Air Force Base, uh, which is in Missouri, uh, Shaw Air Force Base is a new base for us on the East Coast. It's in Sumter, South Carolina, about 40 minutes from Columbia. Yeah, so those are all the uh, the bases you can get assigned for in MQ-9s. So overseas locations? We do not. Not, uh, not uh, for... Perfect. MCE, yeah. but Perfect. for deployments we do. Yep. How would you explain your job to someone else that 
doesn't really know what it is. Like you, when you were first joining, you didn't know what it was. So if you could go back and explain to yourself what all does this job do, what would you tell yourself? Well, without leaving out some of the fancy terms um, like ISR or close air support, an easy way to explain to somebody that's new to the job is you're basically a co-pilot for this aircraft. You are very much responsible for knowing the aircraft systems just as much as the pilot does that sits on your that sits in the left seat. Um, you're going to be controlling a camera that's on this aircraft that is responsible for um, locating and finding dangerous uh, and dangerous threats to America. Also being directly involved with ops. So you'll be con controlling a laser that uh, that uh, that guides in laser guided munitions uh, directly. So you are directly involved uh, in eliminating threats in this career field. How many hours a week do you work on average? So the amount of hours I work a week on average, it depends. So right now um, I'm an instructor for my job. So uh, it's being in the uh, in a tr not technically a training squadron, but we're training uh, launch recovery people. And you usually work about 8 to 12 hours a day. Uh, usually when you fly training missions, it's usually no more than two, two and a half hours. When you're flying operational, depending on your mission set, so if you're an MCE person, so MCE is basically somebody who is here in the States and they are... Uh, flying a plane that is overseas, so somewhere in a Middle Eastern or Central Asian country, uh, you will work pretty rigorous shift work. So you'll be, you know, sometimes in the seat flying eight hours, you know, nine hours, and uh, and then you have to go back home and go to sleep, and, and you know, it's uh, it's very rigorous shift work, and that usually changes every six to seven weeks. When you do launch recovery, uh, which this is the side of the job where you deploy, you'll work your shift work down range, and you'll normally work uh, nine to twelve hour shifts there as well. And it's pretty non it's pretty non stop, depending on the de deployment location. So you were just talking about deployment. So what would you say the deployment tempo of your job is? It's pretty fast paced, depending where you go. Um, a lot of things can affect flight operations, so uh, weather is obviously the biggest one. Um, if we have bad weather that rolls through and we can't get planes up, and obviously if you can't see bad guys on the ground because there's clouds, there's no reason for us to be up there. So um, that obviously affects it. But other than that, the, the overall demand for um, MQ-9s on the battlefield today is immense. We have, a, uh, we have a very long time that we can be on station that... Uh, and it's providing that constant overwatch for uh, friendly forces that uh, manned aircraft just aren't able to do uh, in, in that amount of time. We don't have to, you know, go up and get aerial refuel every hour and a half, two hours. We can be there for, you know, many hours on, on station, um, providing that assuring uh, guidance to our, our guys on the ground. Um, I know on this last deployment I was on, uh, which I, I did uh, six months, uh, I only had two days where we didn't fly, where we technically weren't doing anything because we had bad weather, but we were still expected to show up, obviously, anyway, and be ready. So, it's a very demanding and mission, so it'll, you'll, it'll burn you out, for sure. So, a big question that people ask about is transferability to the civilian world. So, do you get any, like, certifications, or how easy does this job actually transfer out to a civilian job? If you want to do the same job and keep your like military benefits and your retirement, uh, the U.S. Border Patrol and Department of Homeland Security, you can do the same job there with MQ-9s. Um, obviously, you're doing stuff uh, directly involving with the United States. You can also get jobs. Uh, they're 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 mainly contractor jobs, um, so you can do the same job. It it pays well, but um, depending on what qualifications you got when you were active duty, really helps you on the outside because they're, the qualifications you get active duty are a lot harder to get on the civilian side. Are you planning on making this a career, or are you planning on getting out after your enlistment? So I'm planning on making this a career. Um, don't really want to do this as enlisted. I'm working on uh, hopefully pushing out my OTS application next year. But uh, even if I could, I would. Even if I was 
had the choice to stay enlisted, I would still stay in. Uh, I love the Air Force. Uh, I would definitely wouldn't leave this career field either. What advice do you have for someone that's getting this job? First things that is good to evaluate with yourself is if you're a conscientious objector, so if you don't know what that means, if you're not okay with uh, basically killing someone um, or seeing you know people die or obviously directly doing that, then this is not the job for you. You have plenty of opportunities um, and training to opt out. So once the, you get to your operational squadron, wherever that's at, there's pretty much, uh, it's pretty hard to turn back from there. There's a lot of opportunities to wash out and to, you know, not make it through this training. So if you're not committed to studying and uh, if you're not disciplined enough, you're probably not going to make it through. It's, it's pretty difficult training. Uh, but the overall reward of this is, you know, you're, it's not every day that as an enlisted person, you're going to be so directly involved in operations, especially um, actually taking out, uh, you know, dangerous, high value what targets. What advice do you have for someone if they wanted to be successful in this career field? If you want to be successful in this career field, you, you can't just show up to work every day and then uh, just do your job and go home. It, it's, if you really want to be successful, you have to go the extra mile. And that's one of the things that, that the Air Force burns out of people, you know, and I understand, you know, the military isn't for, every, for everybody. But to be successful in Scurfield, you have to push yourself to know things. So push yourself to read the public, understand the publication, the publications, push yourself to learn the systems, aircraft systems knowledge as much as you can. Those are the things that are going to make you successful, and that obviously that desire to learn. Um, it's that getting, you know, learning from other people that have a lot of experience, and then being able to instruct that or pass that on. That's that's how you be successful.